All right, hey, and welcome to the State of Tech Podcast, Episode 9, Interactive Whiteboards, recorded January 24th, 2012. I'm Sean Beavers, and if this is your first time tuning into the podcast, this is a bi-weekly podcast covering educational technology and best practices in and around the state of Ohio. And as always, I'm joined by my two cohorts, Eric Griffith and Eric Kurtz. How are you guys doing this fine Saturday afternoon? Finally getting a little bit of snow here in Northeast Ohio, of course, uh, we uh, had uh, school off on Friday because it was the end of our semester, so it was uh, uh, you know a work day for the staff and the kids were off, and that's the first time we finally get snow. So it just seems kind of kind of crazy, but uh, it is nice to see a little bit of snow finally. Uh, Eric G, what's it like for you guys down there? Good, good. Uh, weather-wise, uh, there's a little bit of snow on the ground, and uh, I'm working through the cold season uh, into bron- <coughs> excuse me bronchitis, possibly pneumonia. And eventually, probably Ebola. Uh, Ebola. Sorry, uh, something. These cough drops numb my lips. lips. So, uh, yeah. Other than sickness, uh, with the entire family, uh, doing fine. Doing fine. All right. Great to hear. I, I definitely had a hard time making it through those uh, giant snowdrifts down by me here in, in in Cincinnati. That half an inch was a real, really added about an hour to my commute. All right, well, uh, we also have some guests with us today, uh, Nick Ryder and TJ Usin. if you guys want to give a shout-out. Uh, Nick, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from and what you do. Okay, I'm the technology coordinator for a small school district in northwest Ohio called Van Lu Local Schools. Um, we are pushing technology pretty hard, and I'm here to help talk about interactive whiteboards today and what we've done with our implementations. So, Excellent. Uh, here. And uh, TJ? Uh, yeah, I'm from Huron City Schools. Um, we got we were actually off on Friday due to the snow, so we got our first snow day of the year, um, which coincides great for a four-day weekend. Um, just trying to catch up after the break. We did just launch our school iPhone app, so we're getting a lot of good stuff coming back from that, and can't wait to talk about interactive whiteboards. And TJ, you might, for our audio podcast listeners, want to describe what the headgear you have uh, on right now. Yes. Um, so last time I was on, I had an awesome turkey hat, so I had to one-up myself, and today we're rocking out the uh, frog hat, courtesy of one of my teachers. I, this is, I, have not, I do not own this hat. I'm actually borrowing it from one of my great teachers that I'm going to talk about today. So. Awesome. All right, well, let's take a look at the news, uh, what's going on in and around the state of Ohio. Eric? Yeah, absolutely. Um, got a couple of things to share here today as far as news goes. Um, if you're uh, listening from outside of the state of Ohio, some of these things may not apply to you, but um, you know, hopefully a, a few will cross over. Uh, first thing up, it's a real quick announcement that the new technology planning tool has been released from eTech for those of us that are tech coordinators and might need to do the technology planning tool. Uh, you can go to the eTech site and can access the new TPT portal that is up and running. Uh, another thing uh, to uh, mention real quick is that the um, eTech State Tech Conference that is coming up here in February, they have announced that the tech coordinators uh, across Ohio are going to have a special meeting uh, during the conference. So if you're a tech coordinator and you're going to be attending the uh, eTech Ohio Educational Technology Conference, I believe it's February 14th, 15th, and 16th, on Tuesday, February 15th, right after the keynote speaker in the morning, uh, they will be having the uh, tech coordinators meeting. Um, you can still, of course, go into the eTech site and register and sign up to attend the conference. Um, something important to tag on to the end of that um, is that we will be then shortly after that meeting on Tuesday, we will be recording a live State of Tech podcast there at the eTech conference. So right around 1.45 on Tuesday, February 15th, so probably shortly after the tech coordinators meeting, uh, we are going to be in Battelle Hall on the main stage for a real honest-to-goodness awesome live recording of the State of Tech podcast. So if you're going to be there, please try to uh, work that into your schedule and see if you can uh, pop into Battelle Hall Tuesday at 1.45 and join us for a live recording. We hope to also get several people to uh, pop up on stage with us and and, uh, and join us. So that'll be a really exciting uh, opportunity. Next quick uh, news item coming up on February 1st is uh, Digital Learning Day. And this is something that's uh, nationwide. Um, they're basically trying to pick a day of the year to uh, emphasize digital learning. 
which basically would be any time that you're using technology to help in and help students with, uh, with with learning and teachers with teaching. And so there's this website which is digitallearningday.org and really they're just asking to raise awareness. They're asking for schools all over the country to, if they can, take February 1st and do something that day, whether it be talking about digital learning, whether it be trying something new like they encourage to use a mobile device in your classroom or do an online lesson or start a wiki or use digital storytelling or something, um, or just to showcase some successes that you've had with digital learning. So just a chance to sort of open up that conversation a little bit more and a lot of states, including Ohio, um, are going along with that. And February uh, 1st is going to be Digital Learning Day. So perhaps there's something um, that folks at their school can think of uh, to do that day to uh, raise uh, awareness of how we're using technology in education. And then the uh, final bit of news I have is that there is a uh, conference coming up in uh, sort of my neck of the woods here. So if you're anywhere in the Northeast Ohio area, there's the uh, Neotech conference coming up on Friday, March 16th. This is uh, held up in Akron. Um, the uh, Quaker Square Inn Conference Center by the by the University of Akron, and it's a great conference. Nice thing about it is it's free, totally free, and even includes lunch with it. Um, they you know usually have a lot of great speakers. Um, I was there last year. I'll be speaking again there this year. But just want to encourage people if you're in this neck of the woods to check out the uh, Neotech Conference that'll be coming up March 16th. You can go to neotechconference.org. Uh, to get more information and to register. Um, and uh, TJ, I thought you may had something you wanted to mention also news-wise? I did indeed. Um, the, I just saw a little news blip come up, um, actually I believe Thursday, that Apple's having a um, education event. So I, I can't remember the last time Apple's done just an education announcement. Um, and it is in the Big Apple. Um, and that's on Thursday, January 19th at 10 a.m., and that's Eastern Standard Time. Um, there's a lot of rumors, um, the biggest rumor being the digital textbooks, so definitely stay tuned for that. All right, great. Thanks, TJ. Thanks, Eric. Uh, now we're going to take a look at our awesome things of the week, and I actually had two this week that I wanted to share. This past week in Las Vegas, uh, the Consumer Electronics Show was going on, and one of the things that they announced, or Samsung announced, was that they are releasing a new Chromebook uh, and also a Chrome box. And the Chrome box has the same specs as the uh, Chromebook, so it's got a dual-core Celeron processor, uh, 2 gigs of RAM, 16 gig solid state drive, but there is no word yet on pricing. So this might be a nice option um, if you don't want the Chromebooks or maybe you want to have a lab of, of uh, desktops, you could jump on this Chromebox. Uh, my second awesome thing of the week is uh, if this, then that, and what that allows you to do is to plug information from one of your web services into another one and you create tasks or you can use what they call these uh, pre-created recipes. So I will pull that up here on my screen but also the link will be there uh, in the show notes. So this is the website, if this then that and uh, just real quickly to show you how this works, go ahead and sign into my account here. Um, they have a whole bunch of different channels. These channels would represent the different web services that you use and I'm going to go ahead and just create a task just to show you how easy this is to do. So first I pick my uh, channel trigger and I'm going to go ahead and pick Twitter. So I'm going to go down here and click on Twitter. And I'm going to say if somebody mentions me, and actually I have this set up for the state of tech, so if somebody mentions the state of tech, I'm going to click on create trigger. And then I want it to send me an email, so I click on Gmail. And I'm going to tell it to send me an email when somebody mentions the state of tech. I want it to send it to my personal email address. I click on create action. I give it a description. And I click on create task. Now this will update every 15 minutes. You can power it off so you can pause it if you want to. You can save it as a recipe and share it with other if this then that users. Um, but I think a really cool service and there's lots and lots of neat things that you can do. So definitely check that one out. And I'm going to throw it over to Eric Kurtz for his awesome thing of the week. 
Well, that really is pretty cool. I like that. I had not heard of that uh, site before, so thanks for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> my awesome thing of the week is um, actually another podcast. Um, I figure if you're listening to the State of Tech podcast, then chances are that you like podcasts and uh, you see the value in you know getting information brought to you about ed tech things I figured maybe share one of the other podcasts that we've benefited from um, up in my neck of the woods Aurora schools um, got some friends up there who put on an ed tech podcast um, uh, one of the guys is Andrew Sams. He's one of the tech guys there. And then uh, Michelle uh, Gerbrick as well is one of the tech folks there. And they do a, uh, a series of podcasts, and um, they call it all part of the uh, Tilda Netcast Network. Uh, so they've got a couple of different podcasts there. So the web address is tilde, T-I-L-D-E dot Aurora dash schools dot org. Again, check the show notes if you want to get the link right to it. And then... Um, they do a couple, but the one that uh, I typically follow is Learning with Technology Weekly. It's a weekly podcast. You can watch it live uh, from 3 to 4 on Wednesdays, or you can just you know catch the recorded ones at any point that you want. Um, and recently, the one that they just had put up was about Google Apps. And I know that we had done a show on Google Apps as well with the State of Tech, uh, but they took a little bit of a different approach with their particular one, uh, where we were doing a whole lot of the, we're going to assume you already know what Google Apps is, and we're going to talk more about um, all the different things you can do with it. Uh, they actually backed up a little bit more and really gave it just a really solid introduction to what all is involved in Google Apps, what the different programs are, some ideas of what you might be able to like to do with it. But again, just a really nice overview. So if you're looking to add one more ed tech uh, you know, podcast into your group of podcasts that you want to listen to, I would encourage uh, the Learning with Technology Weekly that uh, Andrew and Michelle put on through Aurora City Schools. Uh, so just share that as a pretty cool thing. Uh, Eric G., what do you have for us? Uh, actually, mine is a, is a piece of hardware uh, as well, and it's something that I use almost, uh, I'd say, once or twice a week um, when I repair PCs and it's something that you can you know use if or you should have if you're getting rid of let's say an older computer you know older computers they have you know hard drives inside and those contain information and you don't just want to you know send it off to a recycling company and and leave your information on there um, especially if you have pictures or any type of data on there so um, it's not a hammer or anything to smash the hard drive it's actually some a piece of technology to get the technology or I'm sorry the information off and what it is here is just a little hard drive adapter so it's USB here to whatever the connection is on your hard drive and I'll share this uh, screen real quick here and several companies make these and um, uh, the one I like the most is made by Vantech and I'll scroll through the image here it's about you know uh, between 999 and and uh, 1799 I've seen uh, but you connect the hard drive to one of these three connectors, either IDE, serial ATA, or the smaller laptop IDE, whatever that's called. And um, then you plug it into your computer, and it turns your hard drive into an external hard drive. So very good way to just plug in your old hard drive and get information off of it. And, of course, this one, the reason I like this model is it comes with different adapters um, to power on and off. Um, your hard drive and uh, the neatest thing about it is it has this little power switch right here so you can turn it on and off safely you know you don't have to just plug it right into the power outlet and you know hope that everything is okay when you plug in the the hard drive so great little uh, piece of technology there and again between ten and fifteen dollars and very useful uh, very very easy to use so that was my awesome thing of the week Eric that's really cool thank you because we often have hard drives at Soita that, you know, like you said, what are you going to do with them? You want to get the data off of them, and if you don't have a giant hammer or a cinder block, that might be a viable option. Yep. yep. Well, we're going to go ahead and dive right into our main topic today, which is interactive whiteboards, and this is going to be a two-part series. Today we're going to be talking about just the different technologies and dif the different uh, boards that are out there, um, and then in two weeks, I believe on January 28th, we're going to actually talk about how you integrate interactive whiteboards, so you know how you can use this in your classroom uh, and some best practices. So we have about seven different products that we're going to talk about today, uh, and 
the first one is uh, smart boards. And I've been using smart boards for quite a while. I used them when I taught uh, fifth grade and uh, still use them today, do some training with Soida. And these are manufactured by Smart. Um, they range in price, uh, starting around $1,400 uh, for one of the more, I believe, basic models, although Eric Kurtz was able to get a special rate of about uh, $1,200, so that's a little bit of a discount. And they range in size from 77 inches to 78 and a half for their uh, larger boards. Um, the interactive technology that these use, they have a touch-sensitive surface, very similar to a, a mouse pad or a trackpad. Um, and the more expensive models, as you move up through the different tiers, actually feature multi-touch. So you can have two students at a time actually working at the board, and they can use the pen tray or, or use one of the pens from the pen tray if they want to for input, or um, <clears throat> you can also use your fingers as well. Um, their software, I, I think, is excellent, which is the smart notebook software. That's one of the reasons that I like using smart boards over some of these other manufacturers that we're going to be talking about today. And... Um, they do have a five-year limited warranty once you've registered the board. So let's open it up, I guess, to our panel, maybe talk a little bit about the pros and cons. And TJ's had some, um, some experience with these, so if you want to go ahead and chime in, TJ. Sure. Um, I have used smart boards um, at Fireland Schools, and then here at Huron we have them in every room. Um, we just moved into the Unified where the pro projector, you don't have a separate projector and smart board. It's all built into one um, I don't know. I guess everything's built into the smart board. Um, what's nice about that is I feel that that's a lot easier to move. I can tell maintenance I want this board on this wall. Instead of them having to move the board and then trying to move the projector and line up the projector, they simply just move the whole thing. So the Unified's been, you know, great. Um, I like the tie-in with their other products. Um, they have a smart uh, document camera. And what's nice about that is and correct me if I'm wrong, like if you had an Elmo document camera, you would have to switch VGA inputs or some of the other ones that worked like a digital camera where this pulls it into Smart Notebook. You could draw on it live, and it, just the tie into that and their response systems, it makes for a nice digital classroom. Well, the nice um, thing about it. Another thing I like about it. Sorry, TJ, I was going to say the nice thing about their um, document camera is you also have that button on the toolbar, so you can just click on that and pull that image in right from your from the camera instead of, like you were saying, if you have just a traditional Elmo, that option's not there. Right, there's a lot of, like, switching back and forth, and the important, my goal is to get teachers back to teaching quicker, and they could just hit a button on a toolbar, and they're there. Um, another thing to that point is... Um, they do have a parts on hand program. Um, I actually just got the box this week where they send you um, two of each part so you have it on the shelf. So that way something breaks. I don't have a teacher down for a day, two days, three days. I can take the SC9 controller, which controls the board, go in there, try it out. It works. Okay, I'm going to leave this one in here, and then I'll just replace my shelf stock. So them, like the fact that they do that has been a huge help. Um, just to have parts on hand. I mean, like I said, we can get teachers teaching and not have another technology issue, and that's great. Um, one thing, too, um, with our last project, we got something called a starter grant through SMART, um, and we were able to secure a lot cheaper pricing. Um, I don't, I mean, it's public record, but we got really good pricing for not only the boards, but with responders and document cameras, like more than half off. Um, so if you are talking to your SMART rep, um, Ask them if they still do the starter package, just because it did save my district a lot of money. All right, and Eric Kurtz, well, I think yeah. you guys have some of those in your in your district. Yeah, um, yeah. We don't have a ton of interactive whiteboards. We're still working on rolling that out, which is why I'm really excited about this particular podcast to find out about all our different options. But Smart is pretty much what we have for the most part. I have a few different you know things as well. But um, yeah, we were able to get uh, about two hundred dollars knocked off the price of the board just by working with our reps. So yeah, I think that is an important thing to do to try to uh, talk to your reps. Um, as far as the smart uh, board goes, uh, I'll mention a positive, and then I'll, I'll go to the to the con, to the to the negative end of it. On the positive, I mean, well, certainly, I mean, everybody loves the smart notebook. Uh, there's loads and loads of resources available online, the smart teacher exchange, all that great stuff there. Um, but um, the the thing that I, I think we see a lot is 
little kids especially, um, the ability to simply touch the smart board and to have that tactile interaction, that, that is really good. There, there's something to be said for that. And we just put a bunch in our kindergarten, and that's been one of the responses that we've gotten is that it is great for the little children just to be able to go up and touch the board and not have to use a pen, but they're able to use their finger. Now, of course, that can be a drawback. I mean, it certainly can be because if you're trying to write on the board, you don't want to let your, your hand hit it or your elbow hit it or lean against it because all that's going to register as an interaction. And so what could be a positive to some could be a negative to others. The real negative, though, that for us anyway that I've been running into um, is just the fact that there's a lot that can break on a smart board, and we've had the ones we've had for long enough that they're exiting out of that five-year warranty. And uh, because the entire board is the technology, you know, anything in that whole board with, with that touch surface could start to go. And over time, they do go. Um, we've had a lot of boards with dead spots that show up, or boards that I write on the top and it shows below. Or if you just try to draw a grid, it looks like you know you you know have been drinking way way too much because the lines just go all over the place. Even though you're writing perfectly straight, it's wiggly like crazy there. Uh, so they do start to go, and when they go, if they're outside of that warranty, it can be very expensive to repair them and very expensive. To replace them, and um, you know, so we are a little concerned about that, and wanting to look more at boards that. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious to see more about boards that that don't put all of the technology into the entire board, but maybe uh, have some other options. So yeah, and that and that's one of the issues too that we've seen, Eric. Is uh, we have I think three different boards. We have the latest model, which is the 800 series. Uh, fantastic board, like you were talking about, especially with young children. This one actually has that motorized track, so you can raise it and lower it, you know, depending on the height of the, I guess, teacher or the students that you have in your class. Um, but the older models, like you were saying, that are out of warranty, we've seen that the controller box is starting to go bad. Um, even the, the RJ45 plug that connects it to the actual board uh, isn't working correctly. So, you know, that, it, that has been a concern. One of my uh, biggest concerns with, with Smart was when I worked in Vandalia, um, they had just came out with the, I guess, their new rule of you can't install the Smart Book, I'm sorry, Smart Notebook software unless you have a Smart Board in the classroom. And licensing, you know, I can see the reason why, but, you know, a teacher uh, needs to be able to take that software home and work on it too. And, you know, if we have to pay for an additional license uh, to do that, you know, then, then that's an issue. Um, for myself in uh, Mechanicsburg, though, we had, uh, uh, when I arrived there, there were about s four or five or six older smart boards, and that was one of the first things I wanted to do was, you know, s saturate the building with the uh, smart notebook software because, you know, it worked well even without a smart board, you know, uh, very easy for a, a teacher or a student to create some sort of a presentation and throw it up there, uh, you know, if we put the smart board in the lab or something like that. But, uh, yeah, I was, I was told by a smart rep that, you know, that was... Not not okay unless we had an actual board or a smart product inside the classroom. So, TJ, do you want to go ahead and? Yeah, I had a very. I guess my interaction was a little bit different in the smart licensing because it says as needed. Um, so the way it was explained to me is, let's say a student needs to use it um, for school or whatever, it extends onto that. Um, don't quote me on that, but it says as needed. Um, one thing as an alternative that I did want to bring up is um, that they do have express versions. Um, so there's an online uh, web app for Smart Notebook. Um, so you can create notebook files, you can edit notebook files, which is great for teachers that might just need to change one thing real quick and they don't have Smart Notebook installed. Um, and that's Smart Express, Smart Notebook Express. Um, as well as an installer for the Express version for Mac and PC. So you can install a um, not as robust set of tools, but enough to open notebook files, edit things. Um, so it really extends into the home and not just locking it at school. Yeah, smart boards are definitely, you know, the, the Kleenex of, uh, of that technology. I mean, everybody, anytime they look at a board that looks interactive in any way, they said, oh, you have a smart board. So, I mean, they've definitely, they are the name brand, you know, at least here in Ohio. I was going to say, it's almost become synonymous like iPod with, you know, MP3 players. Yeah. All right. Um, anybody want to add anything else about smart boards? 
Well, I'll, I'll wrap up that and transition into the next one. Um, I just did want to clarify the, the discussion about the licensing. W whatever the gray area may be, what is black and white is they clearly say you, you cannot use the notebook software on a competitor's product unless you have paid for a specific license for that. So that is not a gray area. I do hear a lot of confusion about that sometimes out there. But with all the other products we're about to mention, if you want to use the smart notebook software with them, you do have to pay for a license for that. Now, I've heard wildly different prices, but my personal rep that we work with, the and I've got the email to show it, said it is $599 for a license for it. So now maybe you can find it some other way, but I'm just saying if you really want the smart notebook software on a competitor's device, you, you do have to pay to have that be legal. But uh, with that said, let's do the transition to some competitor devices. And I think you as well put, yes, yeah, smart does seem to be, you're right, the, the Kleenex uh, of, of the interactive whiteboards because I hear that all the time too, and I say the same thing, you know. Um, you know, no, it may not be a smart board. It may be something else, and that's okay. The first alternative that we're looking at today is the Polyvision Eno. Uh, let me go ahead and pull that up here. And again, if you're um, only getting the audio version of the podcast, I, I apologize. Uh, some of this stuff, uh, you know, you might not be able to see as well, but uh, definitely check out the show notes to get links to all the things I am showing. Uh, but the Polyvision Eno is one of the uh, uh, interactive whiteboards that is made by Polyvision. There, there's a lot of options there. There's the Eno Classic and the Eno Click and the Eno Flex and the Eno This and the Eno That. Um, I'm mostly going to be just talking about the, the Eno Classic for the most part here. Um, this is a board where the technology is not in the board. So one of the very first divergences we're seeing here as we compare this to the smart board is it's completely flipped on its head. Where the smart board, it doesn't matter what you touch it with. If it's your finger, if it's the pin, whatever. Whatever. That's the total opposite here. With a Polyvision Eno board, the board is dead. There's no power to it. There's nothing happening with the board. It's, it doesn't plug into anything at, at all. Instead, the board has an incredibly fine uh, pattern of dots on it that you're not going to be able to see. It, it wouldn't be something that your eye is going to pick up, but the pin will. Now, um, I'm showing here in the, uh, in the screen share that what the pin looks like, there's actually a little camera right inside of the end tip of the pin there and that camera seeing that dot pattern on the board and it's recognizing, oh, I know where I'm at. I'm at this coordinate by that coordinate. So it can tell what you're touching on the board by the camera that's in the pin. Now, that doesn't mean you have to get comfortable with holding that pin. You need to make sure you're holding it right because if you're pointing it at a real steep angle, that camera may not be seeing where it's at. So you do do it, you definitely do have to hold it in a certain way. And I should mention, we do. this is one of the brands that we do have in our district besides Smart. So I do have a very small amount of experience with it and sharing from that. Um, with that in mind, the price range starts around the 1500 mark or so and kind of goes up from there. So I think it is safe to say it is very similar in price range to the, to the smart products, um, a lot of similarity there. Um, and of course, they do have other options too, like they do have a little uh, Eno Mini, they call it. I'll pull that up here real quick so you can see it too, which is kind of like with smart, you know, how they have like the airliners, things like that. I think most of the boards have that sort. Yes, and that girl is very happy, isn't she? Uh, I always love the... Uh, the stock photos that people have for these. She's very happy or very frightened. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, we'll assume she's very happy to have her Eno Mini there. And this as well. There's no power to this. It is not a battery device. The Eno Mini is just a small version of the Eno Classic. And basically, as you point the pen at it, it figures out where it's at on the screen and, and then controls uh, your computer from there. Um, the uh, pen, of course, is the technology. So uh, if something breaks, that's what gets replaced. Uh, the uh, Eno board has a lifetime forever warranty. They say it'll never, ever, ever break because there's nothing to break. But if something ever happened, they would be able to go ahead and, and replace it for you. Instead, it's the pin, which if I understand correctly, is about $150 for the, for the uh, pin if you need to replace that. But again, much cheaper than replacing an entire board. Sizes go from about 78 inches diagonal up to about 96 inches diagonal. Um, and the software that they use a little bit different than smart here, and this is one of the, the big things. People who love smart boards love the smart notebook. Polyvision doesn't uh, really have its own uh, specific um, software that they create. Instead, they've partnered up with um, 
uh, software called RM Easy Teach, and a lot of different products use this. This is like a third-party uh, interactive uh, notebook type of software, and it's it's actually really good. I mean, it's it's not a bad piece of so software at all. I mean, it's got widgets that you can bring out that are all interactive and a media bank and content packs and all kinds of stuff. It supports multi-touch, uh, and I should. That's an important thing to mention, I guess, that right out of the gate, the PolyVision Eno uh, does support multi-touch. So I think you can have up to three. Uh, I was reading you could have three different people uh, touching it at a time with one of the pins. Um, and the pins do communicate back to the computer via Bluetooth. So it is a pretty small USB Bluetooth dongle that you plug into the computer that the pins communicate back. And there's a decent... Um, uh, amount of support out there for the RM Easy Teach. They've got a site called RM Easy Learn where you can go and you can go and pick a subject area or pick a grade level or pick you know what sort of activity type you want and it will bring up downloadable content packages and lessons similar to the smart uh, teacher exchange that they have out there. So that's a very, very, very quick overview of what it's what it's like. Um, uh, and I understand, Nick, you've had some experience with this. So um, I'm going to let you go ahead and share what you see as some pros and cons of a board like this. OK. One of the problems that we dealt with in our building is old. the elementary wing was built in 1960 before they really plan for electricity and that kind of thing. So um, any boards that would need power or anything, I know electricity was around in the 60s, but apparently people weren't thinking that we might need it in the future when they build our school. So um, basically, we had to find a board that first didn't need any power. Uh, this was a good solution because the Eno Click um, fit us well. Second reason the Eno Click fit was because we had all old slate chalkboards that were built into the walls that we could not remove. Um, there was no way to get an actual whiteboard, even for markers, up there unless we drilled into the slate. And luckily for us, the chalkboards were magnetic, and the Eno Click uh, was a good solution because you can just click it with magnets right into a magnetic surface, and it installs in a snap. I'm going to share my screen and show you that video of how easy it can be to install. You just need about two people to make sure that it's level and you can write a level on top of it and snap it right to the board and it goes pretty darn simple. Um, that really saved us since session and uh, we were looking at putting one into every single classroom in the elementary. So every classroom was set up the exact same with the exact same chalkboards. It worked very well. Um, like Eric said, the power is really in the pen with the IR camera that is in the tip of the pen. One of the cons that our teachers have seen is that sometimes when they hand it to a kid, they'll hold it upside down and write with it wrong. Um, you know, we stop them and they get used to it. And we've pretty much not had any problems for about, you know, after the first couple weeks of getting used to it. Um, it uses one AAA battery. The pen battery life is not very good. I uh, plan on replacing the batteries quite often. I just stock up the day after Thanksgiving. I head to Menards and buy me a case of AAAs, and we're good to go. Um, there's no accidental interaction because it, it only works with the pen. The RM Easy Teach software, it is a good software package, um, but one thing we looked at in our district is that we wanted everyone to be on the same page with the same software package, and we wanted to make it the best and easiest that it could be. Uh, I, I didn't want to be married to any hardware. We just wanted the hardware that would work best for the rooms that we needed to install in, and we wanted to tie it all together with software. So it is nice that it does come with the free software, though. The support's very good. Um, I haven't had any issues, really, other than with a pen. I, I had to order one replacement, and it was here, and not a big deal. Warranty covered it. They shipped me another one, little to no questions asked. And uh, other than that, um, one of the other drawbacks is the reflection on it. Sometimes in an extreme sunlight that there is a pretty good glare because there is a glass surface on it. So that's one thing we battle. Um, if it becomes an issue, you just draw the shades back and 
use it in the dark. But other than that, it's been working very well, and our elementaries and our teachers uh, are enjoying it. And Nick, I apologize. I might have uh, forgot to mention, but um, one of the neat things about it also is it really is a whiteboard as well as an interactive whiteboard, correct? Um, you can use regular dry erase markers on it. You can use um, uh, magnets will stick to it, like you have letter magnets or things like that stick to it. Um, you yeah. can even, if you accidentally use like um, even a, a regular Sharpie, um, they, they, they always show that in all their demonstrations. But yeah, it's a totally normal dry erase markers are perfectly fine on it. But if you do like a Sharpie or something, oh no, I used a Sharpie, it cleans up really, really well. You can, you know, just put a regular dry erase marker on top of that and wipe it. And so it, 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 I guess the idea is if you're, if you're not turning on the projector at that moment and if you're not using it for interactive purposes, you're also not losing this portion of your the front of your classroom to be able to um, you know give that up you can just use it as a regular one and then you were going to mention there's some little, little magnetic strip yeah. with a stick on it right you've got yeah that. it is very cool like you said with the uh, interactive piece they've got these little magnets that you can cut up you can put wherever in the room and you can touch them with the pen and it's like a heart or a software piece that's built into the driver for the board itself so you can click on different colors change the pen, the keyboard, uh, change it into a different mode where it will allow you to desktop annotate. Um, it's a very cool little piece of hardware slash software that's built into the Eno platform that you don't get with anything else, um, which I thought was pretty cool. And it is, it's very, very important to have the uh, dry erase too, like you said. Well, one question I have, Nick, is, and one thing that I see, I guess, with the smart notebook is it seems like the learning curve isn't, um, I guess, too impossible or, uh, you know, people are able to pick up the smart notebook software pretty easy. How would you say it is in terms of that uh, RM Easy Teach? Are the teachers able to pretty much get up and run with it or do you find yourself having to do a lot of training or how's that been? The RM Easy Teach has been more of a challenge of the software. Uh, we actually decided not to go with that as our choice of software. We chose, uh, actually, the Promethean Act with all of our interactive whiteboards in the school district. We just seemed that it was easier to use and that our teachers picked it up a lot quicker. And speaking of Promethean, I think that's our, our next board, right? So, Sean, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about the Promethean? Sure, absolutely. Um, we actually have a Promethean board um, at SOIDA. We do a little bit of their training as well. And um, <clears throat> in terms of price range, these start out around... Uh, $2,099 for the 87-inch board and $2,299 for the 95-inch board. Um, now, that's the uh, 500 series, right? Right. That's, the, that's, that's, yeah, there's a 300 series that's a little bit more of an intro model, right? And it's more like the 1300 to 1700 price range. Right. So that's for the 500, and then the, the 300 series, correct, is 1300 for the 78-inch and 1700 for the 95 inch model. So they range from 87 inches up to 95 inches. These are similar, I guess, uh, or the technology is similar to Smarts, where it's a multi-touch surface, surface, excuse me, um, and it does have the dual user capability, um, like the, I guess, upper tiered smart boards, uh, pen input, and it connects to your computer via USB. This uses the Active Inspire software that I think Nick mentioned that he's using with his boards. Um, and they do have an excellent resource uh, for lesson plans and ideas how you can use your Promethean board. It's called Promethean Planet. Um, <clears throat> very easy to navigate. I believe you can find uh, lessons by standard. And um, these boards feature, I believe, a one-year warranty. So you don't get that same five-year warranty as Smart. Um, and Nick, I guess you have some of these as well, if you want to talk a little bit about your experience with the Promethean boards. Yes, we've had Promethean boards for nine years now. We got uh, five of them through a grant. We added a few in after that. Um, they have been rock solid. The pens and the Promethean boards, I really like. They're extremely reasonable to replace. There's no batteries in them. Um, I think they cost 30 bucks if something happens to one. They have replaceable tips and they're just, they feel really ergonomically well in your hand. Um, like you said, Inspire software is very nice. Uh, it's very, very easy to use and it, it includes a uh, personal edition the teachers can take home and they can work on uh, 
things separately and bring it back into school and we don't have to worry about licensing that way and everyone can be uh, provided a copy. That way we can also uh, have our students download the software and create interactive lessons for doing presentations, that kind of thing too. They're super durable, super reliable. Um, all of our boards that have been nine plus years old, no failures. Um, they may not have a warranty very long, can tax support on boards that are nearly a decade old and they still answer all my questions and tell me what to do if I have any issues. It's, it's beautiful. Um, I don't know if they're still the largest interactive online content library. I don't know if Smart's overtaken them yet or not, but they, they have been the largest interactive online library for content for teachers. Uh, I think it started big in the UK with Promethean. And uh, they also produce uh, excellent free teacher professional development online. They have a couple courses set up that are free that your teachers can take to get uh, used to the boards and you can print out a nice little certificate to make everyone feel good, uh, which is always nice. Um, one of the cons is they must be hardwired through USB. Uh, I know there possibly could be a, a, a second party, maybe wireless system added. I know, Eric, if you had anything to add on the, the wireless capabilities, okay. Um, you cannot write on these with dry erase markers, the one that we have, at least. Uh, which poses a big problem because, say, your projector goes down or you're having issues, it's just a big space you can't use in your room for the time being. Um, thing, it can be kind of challenging to mount, but once it's mounted, it's up there forever. We really, we really enjoy the Promethean boards. Uh, the price factor might be a little high for some, but it is quality. And I assume, too, you could probably get a stand for them, I mean, if you wanted to move them from classroom to classroom. Yeah, they they do have the uh, they do have the stands that you can purchase. We had one with the stand, but it became a pain to carry time, so we just took it off the stand and put it on the wall. All right, and uh, Eric uh, G is going to talk a little bit about Mimeo. If you want to go ahead and uh, give us a little intro on that. Yes, definitely. Uh, Mimeo, um, I actually got to test one of these when I was at Vandalia, and uh, let me share my uh, presentation here. Um, they, I don't know if they always. Uh, have done or were always part of Dynamo or Dymo, but uh, I know that I just knew the Mimeo brand. But uh, the one that I'm going to talk about today is uh, the Mimeo X, and I know that Nick has uh, some experience with this as well. So I'll I'll share towards let him share towards the end. Um, the the website is uh, Mimeo.dymo.com, and the interactive technology behind it it's not actually a board. Um, it's just a uh, device that you stick up onto the wall, and I'll, I'll have a picture here in the next slide. But the the cost uh, for uh, the educational cost is about, or educational price, about eight hundred dollars. MSRP is about a thousand. Um, the range on the size of the screen um, is really whatever you want, uh, as long as your projector can handle it. You know, the Mimeo. I've not seen any. Um, uh, disadvantage to a, a screen size. So uh, let's see, let me jump to the picture here. Uh, what the Mimeo is, is you unfold the, the device and then you can suction cup, which the suction cups really didn't work for me that well, but um, I ended up having to use uh, 3M tape, that, that sticky tape, and stick it up onto the wall. And what it is, is it's like a little camera that reads um, you know, a percentage of your board. You know, it's it's looking uh, out to the left and down of your board, or the right and to the down, uh, right and up versus, uh, or depending on where you put it. And the interactive pen is actually just an IR pen. As you tap the board, it reads, okay, this is where it is, um, that, and uh, this is where it is on the board. So um, it's actually a pretty interesting setup to, um, let's see, the pens, uh, the the AA batteries, I found they they last a, a good long time. If forty hours is is what they say, but um, it's it's been weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks um, for the ones that we use. Uh, they have a, a wireless option, so it really doesn't have to be plugged in through USB or anything like that. 
you can attach this wireless module and it was a couple hundred dollars for that and then it connects through a Bluetooth dongle. Um, they also had what's called a capture kit on there which is pretty neat. It's actually uh, the reverse of the reverse of a smart board because you're using the markers and as the markers are drawing on the board it's actually capturing them on the software on the screen. So if you just have a projector um, or I'm sorry didn't have a projector you could just hook the Mimeo up to the board and then write with the markers on the board and it records it on the screen. So the software that they have too is like a recording software that allows you to take notes. It's it's similar to the smart notebook but you know is is nothing compared to the the smart universe that's that's out there or Promethean universe. Um, at eTech this year I'm going to talk to one of their rep about uh, one of the reps about the newest Mimeo system which is called Mimeo Teach and uh, that seems to be an all-in-one solution where they have the the dongle built in right away it doesn't plug in via USB um, you know they really streamlined the product and uh, the setup and the installation so it's a very very neat um, technology to use and um, cost wise you know again it was $7.99 I think when we first bought it it was around six or seven hundred dollars at Vandalia and um, I, I was impressed with it we had um, it seemed our high school folks liked it more because they just wanted to insert a PDF and annotate over the top of that and to do that with the smart notebook software it was a few extra steps you know and the cost for the board to, to put it you know actually hang the board up there was uh, you know a little much for our budget so you know any any other thoughts for uh, before we move on to the next Nick uh, in our situation, we used the uh, Mimeos in the places we already had uh, dry erase boards. We just, you know, that way we could just snap them to the wall. That dry erase board is now interactive. Uh, one thing about these pens, the Mimeo pens, they've got two programmable buttons, one for you know, right-click is what I use, and one for whatever else you want it to be. Um, they're a bigger pen. They fit better in elementary students' hands. And I think they're they're very responsive. And one thing that's neat about them, they make a, a little noise to let you know to check battery life in case battery life is an issue. But you said it's it's not an issue. These things last months and months. They do on one double A. It's it's simply crazy. It is. It's it's pretty amazing. And actually, I think uh, Eric has one of those pens too. It's his Doctor Who uh, pen. I believe you can also use the Doctor Who. Uh, sonic screwdriver. As, as yeah, now come on, now be uh, be nice. Sonic screwdriver. Call it by the right name. Yes, uh, you can use it for anything, though. I mean, uh, they're just they're amazing. So uh, yes, I don't have it with me today. I've got my mug. Sorry, I got my Tardis mug. No I was gonna say that doesn't the sonic screwdriver work with all the products that we're talking about today? I believe it does. Yeah. Yes, it does. All right, Nick. Uh, anything else you want to add about the uh, Mimeo? No, I think you nailed everything. Yeah, the, the, the last thing about the Mimeo, you know, they do have a uh, online interactive uh, training as well. I mean, you know, a lot of staff members say, you know, I really don't have time to sit through a webinar or anything like, or, uh, you know, any of your technical support sessions. So to give them the link to their website and say, all right, follow along through their tutorials. I mean, I believe Smart and Promethean have uh, similar services like that. So, but yeah. Great, All right, well, product. we're going to uh, move right along, and uh, Eric Kurtz is going to talk a little bit about the Epson Brightlink. This is, he, he's been waiting all afternoon for this. Oh, yes. Actually, I mean, I am. I'm pretty excited about, about this product. Um, I, I will say, though, I do not have one of these yet. So everything I'm sharing is what I've seen demoed. I actually have used one. I have seen them demoed. We don't own one yet. Uh, we are working on getting one. Um, and really, it comes in two flavors. Uh, Epson has... Um, one option where it's a projector all-in-one combo and another option where if you already have a projector then it's just this solo module. Um, the projector as you can see here on their website they're recommending it around two thousand dollars and the solo they're recommending around six hundred dollars. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the price range but let me explain uh, how this one works. Um, basically um, I'll start with the, with the solo one just uh, because that that fits our situation a little bit better. Most of our classrooms already have data projectors and I always get 
I'm always a little hesitant to buy a product that's not really meant to be a data projector with a data projector packed in. You know, I know that like Smart and all of them, they'll, they'll give you that all-in-one thing where you've got a data projector as part of it. I always get a little nervous about that because uh, bulbs can be expensive. That's one more thing to break, you know. I, so, you know, well, you know, I like the Casio LED projectors and, you know, we're sticking with those. You get 20,000 hours. They're bulbless, uh, really good price on those. So we, in most of our classrooms, we now have our, our data projectors, but we don't have a lot of interactive whiteboards. We are still playing catch up in that area, but we do have whiteboards, not chalkboards, but just regular whiteboards. So something like this is, is a good option. Basically, here's the way it works. What you do is you mount this camera. It te technically is like an, it's an IR camera. Um, the technology that you're using is, uh, is, is, is an infrared um, type of technology. So there's an IR camera here and it doesn't extend out real far. This picture probably doesn't give you a real good scale but I think it only extends out like a couple of feet. So it's a pretty short arm here and you mount this right above your, your regular whiteboard. So you do have to have some kind of a surface. Just a regular whiteboard is certainly fine. And then basically you use your normal projector, of course. And then what it does is this IR camera is basically taking a look at this whole area here underneath where it's mounted. It's looking at all of your whiteboard. And then you use a pen along with it. I don't know if I may not have a picture of the pen here, but it's just, it's a just a normal, you can kind of picture what it is, just one of the normal pens like you'd have with a smart board or a Mimeo or any of those. But the very tip of the pen, when you touch it to the board, it, shot, it, it releases an IR signal. So it, you know, it sends out infrared light. And so basically the camera is watching for that little infrared light to sort of blink there. Now you're not going to see it, but the camera can see it. And as you touch anywhere on your regular whiteboard, it picks that up and then that's how it, you know, sends the information back to the computer. It does connect via USB. So now we're back to another one of those things where yes, this one does require hard wiring. You do actually connect it back to your computer. Now that's an important thing to note because USB does have a um, maximum distance of 15 feet unless you do some modifications to it, you can buy what they call active USB cables that sort of boost the signal and push it along further. So you, you can definitely extend it, you know, don't get me wrong, you can put another 15 foot extender on it, but as long as it's an active USB cable then you're fine. Otherwise you might have to have a little bit of a concern about uh, where you have your teacher computer placed. But so the basic idea here is if you already have projectors in your in your building, and if you already have whiteboards, you can take advantage, kind of like the Mimeo, you're kind of, you know, saying we've already got a lot of the stuff here. You can take advantage of the fact that you've got a projector, you've got a whiteboard, and you can just mount this Brightlink Solo above the board for 600 bucks. I mean, that's a really, really low cost compared to a lot of the other things we've been looking at. And again, you're not having to worry about the board breaking. The technology is in the camera and it's in the pen. Now the pens are only like 50 bucks to replace, so it's one of the cheaper prices I've seen for a pen where the technology is in the pen. It's not a, a dead pen, it actually is, a, is, is, is creating the infrared signal. So if those do wear out or break, you know, they're, I think it's about 50 bucks to replace those. Now if you're in a situation where you don't even have a data projector, I guess you could think, oh well, you know, maybe I would go with the full Brightlink interactive projector because it's got the projector, it's got the pin, it's got the infrared camera all built into the projector where we're looking more at just the Brightlink itself. Um, as far as negatives though, I mean certainly there always are negatives. Um, from what we've heard, the biggest thing is interference with other IR sources. So like I think some Christmas lights or really, really, really bright sunlight or different things like that that might do some infrared, um, that can interact with it and, and, and interfere with it. So you do have to kind of think about that. Um, the other thing um, would be it does require you to use the pen. Now, some people may think that's great and very well may be, but if there was maybe small children who need to be able to touch a board or if there's somebody who has some, some, some motor control issues, the pin, you know, in any of the systems, if you have to use a pin, could be a challenge for you. Um, other than that, I guess you could look at it as, as a potential challenge. It 
course, doesn't have this smart notebook software, which we all know is a, an excellent piece of software and has an awful lot of great stuff online. Instead, this is using the exact same thing as the Eno. You are using the RM Easy Teach software, and that does come packaged uh, with this at that $600 price. So you do use the RM Easy Teach software, and you do have access to the RM Easy Learn site with all of the different resources that you can download. Um, but this is one that hopefully we will get into um, our building at some point to test, and if so, I'll be very excited to give you guys a real-life follow-up on this. Um, I guess the only other thing to throw out, unless something else has come up with you guys on that, is I didn't mention the size because really there, you know, there isn't a size because you're not buying a board. It really just depends on how big your whiteboard is and how much how big your projector can shine. Uh, they mentioned on the site that it easily can go up to uh, 102 inches diagonal. So uh, it gives you a little bit of background on that. Uh, you guys, any any comments or feedback on the bright link? Yeah, actually, I uh, I inherited uh, four of these when when I first came to Mechanicsburg, and um, they're very very interesting. Um, you mentioned interference, and I thought at first it was our lights. And uh, we were going through a house build project at the time, and they, they swapped out the lights, and we, we still saw the issue um, after that. And then we saw that it possibly could be our IR uh, audio systems in the classroom that are, are doing it. But, um, yeah, I, I out of the four that are in there now, three of them uh, still work just fine. The one does this really weird screen uh, flash on and off thing, and, uh, you know, it it happens on every source when you you click it in. So, I've called for support on that, and uh, the you know they're shipping out a new one. But um, it's a very very easy to use uh, technology, and um, the installation of it too. You know, it was just pop pop it up on the wall. You did have to measure a little bit to get it on your your marker board, but you know after that, uh, you know great great ease of use. Uh, the the driver you know it requires a driver because it is plugged in via USB. Um, the only downside I wish it had HDMI in. It's actually cheaper for me to buy a um, HDMI uh, VCR DVD combo than it is the the ones that they used to use in our classroom now. So um, it's kind of frustrating for that. But uh, other than that, it's it is a pretty neat pretty neat piece of technology. So you're saying that this, though you inherited the projector system, not just the solo. Is that correct? Uh, correct. The okay. 50, the 45 WI or whatever, 55 WI. Okay. Yep. I have four of those. Yep. Okay. Well, very good. Yep. All right. Well, I think we're going to take a look at some more uh, unorthodox or non-traditional uh, whiteboard options, and Eric G is going to be talking about the Wiimote project. Yep, the Wemo project was another one. You know, back in the day when I worked at Vandalia, we were trying to look at low-cost solutions. This was prior to uh, projectors being, you know, mounted in the classroom. So we had to find uh, solutions. And uh, the thing that I came across um, just by googling was uh, something called the Wemo project, and uh, it was created by a guy named uh, Johnny Chang Lee. And uh, it's a pretty neat concept. Uh, the the thinking behind it is you take your Wiimote, you you know mount it to a, a stand or a tripod or something and you aim it at the board your uh, your just regular uh, marker board okay and then you have these IR pens and you write you know over top of the the board with the projector coming down to on top of that board and uh, it's a pretty neat concept um, you again need your Wiimote Nintendo controller, an IR pen, and then some sort of a Bluetooth receiver. So the overall cost of this project can get pretty inexpensive. Um, I think a Wiimote remote at the time for me was uh, $59.99. You know, they now are probably closer to half price there. Um, the pens that I bought are pretty neat. They're from a place called Penteractive US, and they were really cheap. They're about 4 or $5. And... Um, the thing that's a little weird about them is you have to push down on the button to write. It's not, you know, it doesn't happen as you press. Uh, but if I push it, you know, you, you're able to see the little light there on the screen. So just very simple, inexpensive little IR cameras, come in, or IR pens, come in fun colors. You know, teachers love options for colored pens. Um, and, of course, you can build your own pen, and I think that's why 
uh, this became very popular. In fact, one of the pens I, I saw and ended up building myself was called the MacGyver pen. And uh, what it was is a older Explo marker hollowed out. You put an IR um, little LED in the where the marker should be, and then something that you know makes connectivity, you know, activates the pen. And then you use duct tape or in this case electrical tape to tape up the back of it, and you you can you know can build your own pen. Um, the more expensive pens, you know, you can actually buy off eBay, the internet, um, any place that takes POs. Um, actually, when you press down on the pen, it act actually activates the light. So it's kind of a neat, um, you know, if you're going to put some money into it, you know, that's uh, that's one of your options there. Do you know anything about that larger white pen? <laughs> uh, no, it's called the Groove, and uh, I do have some links to some websites that you know show you where to buy and how to make them, Sean. If you're incredibly interested, but well, it bears, it bears a very strong resemblance to a baby whale. That's why I was just oh just curious. <laughs> Well, it's a shame Christmas already came and went because uh, I now know what I'm getting you for next Christmas. So um, I have a list of resources which will be posted to our State of Tech podcast website um, from the three or four different websites that I found of, you know, people building their own and, you know, there's a, a community around them, as well as a YouTube video that shows uh, Johnny Lee demonstrating how the technology works. And, you know, even if you're thinking, uh, you know, I'm going to buy something that's backed by, you know, a large company, just take a look at the software or take a look at the YouTube video because it's a pretty interesting concept. Um, now, the software that uses it, uh, there's three or four different out there. There's a free one that was developed by uh, Johnny and some other folks, and then there's another one called Smoothboard, um, and that actually costs some money. Uh, it, I've seen prices between... Forty nine ninety nine and seventy nine ninety nine, and the seventy nine ninety nine one comes with everything you need, the uh, minus the Wiimote. Um, but you can buy different bundles out there, and all those links uh, that I've shown up there, and actually will include in the show notes, will will get you to that. But yeah, it's a very interesting um, uh, interactive board on the cheap um, type of technology. So uh, one of the this the guys I used to work with at Vandalia. His name is his name is James Norman, and uh, I believe he uses this in his school. And I think he works at Tri County North. He set up a few of these for his math folks, and uh, his. I believe he told me that the the trick to it is to have a smart enough teacher to know how to set it up, so that you know you don't have to go in and and set it up every day for them, because you would have to pair uh, the Wiimote with Bluetooth. Um, you would have to, you know, realign the board almost every time because, you know, the projectors that he had weren't mounted. Um, so it's a, you know, a, an interesting do-it-yourself Wiimote project. So has anybody else uh, experimented with this project? I did um, briefly. It's, you know, it's, it, it's interesting. But, yeah, sorry, TJ, go ahead. Um, something that I've been seeing just little blips about recently um, in the same idea has been um, using the Connect as well, um, Xbox 360 Connect, um, and all the 3D things that they're doing with them. And it also they have it where it works um, as far as gesture recognition. Um, like this, the lady's doing a hand puppet, and you could see how it's actually changing on the board. Um, I think this is something that we definitely should keep an eye on um, as more and more things are developed for the Connect. Um, I think we're going to see possibly more of this in the classroom as well. And, I, and TJ, I think it's important to point out too that I think that Johnny Lee, he's now working for Microsoft. I mean, they scooped him right up after he, um, you know, demoed some of that stuff he was doing with the Wiimote. And actually, um, at CES last week, uh, Microsoft announced that they are coming out with Connect for the PC. So they're going to release those APIs for developers to be able to, you know, do some cool stuff. I think we're and like when that happens. I think that's going to blow up in the education space. Um, just with more interactives, I could see my younger grades going crazy. You know, with some of the fun interactive things. But then my sciences, my physics, and my higher end, I could see them doing some awesome experiments and things with the Connect as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know where where this project is definitely different from you know Smartboard, Promethean, uh, Mimeo, all the others is. <sighs> Those softwares are backed by, you know, websites that have content and lesson plans already made. And the Wiimote project stuff, there are some out there, but definitely nothing close to the, 
you know, to the amount uh, by the other folks. So I mean, it's it's a fun project if you're if you want to get started on it and show a teacher, hey, are you are you sure you really want to, you know, have an interactive whiteboard in your classroom for less than a hundred dollars? You can put something like this together, and if you know the teacher really says yes, you know, I like this type of technology. You know, maybe it's time to move up, or maybe it's time to make the technology permanent. Um, Penteractive US also sells kits to actually mount it to a ceiling grid and uh, some other things. So it it's almost a permanent solution. Now, uh, Eric, I I know you mentioned the software you know that runs it isn't curricular based. You don't have like all of these different resources and stuff. But wouldn't you be able to pair this with other software? Like you know, if somebody did want to spend six hundred bucks to buy a smart notebook, I mean, you, correct? I mean, the software that you're using with the Wemo project is just allowing you to tell the computer where you're touching. You could be running behind that smart notebook or like RM Easy Teach. Um, if you want to buy it just by itself, I believe it's ninety nine dollars. I believe that's the license for RM Easy Teach. So you know, if if you said I, I want some kind of interactive notebook software that could still be running, and you could use so for eighty bucks for this, and then uh, ninety nine bucks for the RM Easy Teach, you could put it together, and you could do that, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, in fact, Microsoft Office has uh, some gestures uh, built in and an inking tool. So I mean, you can even just open up. Uh, you know, one of the latest versions of Office and write, you know, inside there. And that's prior to uh, us learning how to use the smart notebook software at Vandalia, we opened up, um, you know, Microsoft Office, I think it was 2007 at the time, and, and messed around using that software. So, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting project, definitely very geeky. So, yeah, that's all. I was going to ask in chat, but um, for everything we've talked about so far, um, I'm 90% that it's all Mac and PC compatible. Is that correct for your the ones that you've talked about? I know Smart is um, the Wiimote project. I believe there's drivers for both, but I didn't know if that's something that we had to bring up. That you know, to my Mac. knowledge, everything is Mac and PC compatible. Mac and PC, and about half of them are Linux as well. So, yep. Sorry, didn't mean to leave you out, Linus. <laughs> totally, I I don't even think about it. Sorry. <laughs> All right, well, uh, the last thing we're going to be chatting about today is, is tablets and uh, talking a little bit about how you can use, uh, I believe specifically, iPads in your classroom with your existing interactive whiteboards or as an interactive whiteboard. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of the, the programs or apps that I've uh, come across. And I think TJ and Eric are going to talk a little bit about what they've been doing with uh, Apple TVs and iPads. The first um, application that I came across and been using in conjunction with whiteboards is the uh, app called Mobile Mouse. And this is $2.99 in the App Store. This is linked in our uh, show notes. And so what Mobile Mouse allows you to do is essentially use your uh, iPad as a wireless slate. So if you're familiar with the airliner, um, or I think Eric talked about, um, you know, most of these other companies have a some kind of wireless slate that you can use in conjunction with the software or with the board. Um, this does the same thing on your iPad for around $3 for the, for the app. And then, of course, you'd probably want to purchase a uh, stylus to use with that. And there's lots of different kinds of styluses out there. There's the Pogo Sketch. Targus makes a couple ones. You can take a look on Amazon. And it, it works pretty well. Um, it's not perfect. But again, you got to look at you know what is your investment you know probably under ten dollars and if you already have an iPad and you want to use it as a wireless slate, um, this is a, a viable option. Now, do keep in mind you do need to have Wi-Fi because it connects to your computer uh, via Wi-Fi. So um, make sure that you have a wireless network in your in your classroom or where you can set something up. The next option is called Doseri Remote and. This is a little bit different than uh, the previous app. This actually mirrors your desktop on your iPad, um, similar to something like Log Me and Ignition or some kind of VNC app. Um, but kind of what sets it apart is there's some desktop companion software, so the app is free for your iPad, and then you have to spend fifty dollars per license for the desktop companion software. And um, you know, besides being able to mirror your desktop, it also has some annotation tools so that you can write over the top of it that digital ink layer. You have some backgrounds that you can pull in over the top of your desktop, um, graph paper, uh, uh, writing paper, etc. Um, but really, you know, and, and Eric and I think, <laughs> Eric Griffith and I both feel it's not a, a great option. You know, you can try it out for free, I think, for 30 days. Um, 
but you still have to pan and zoom and and, and pinch uh, around to, to I guess to get around your desktop. Uh, and then the last thing that I wanted to mention, uh, and, and the best solution I've found thus far, is using this Splash Top Remote Desktop. And this is, I think, $4.99 in the App Store currently. And um, what I like about this is it, it mirrors your desktop. That's it. Uh, it mirrors it at the same resolution as your iPad, so 1024 by 768, so you don't have to pinch and zoom and move, move around to see your entire desktop. And I use this in conjunction with some Mac and PC software called Ink2Go. And I actually think I saw an article on this on the iPad Academy website, I believe. I can't think of a... I can't remember. Uh, but anyway, the software is linked again in our show notes. And this is 1990 for both the Mac software and the PC software. You can get this for the Mac, I think, through the Mac App Store, or you can download it directly from their website. <clears throat> and the, the ink to go provides uh, the annotation tools, and then the Splashtop desktop remote software allows you to see your, your computer screen so that you can walk around the classroom, you can annotate over the top of, of whatever you're working on, whether that's a Word document or, or a PowerPoint. Um, and again, you're looking at probably about $25 total, and, um, and it works really well. So that's kind of what I've had experience with. I think, TJ, if you and uh, Eric want to talk about the Apple TV. Sure. Um, we recently, and it's funny that we talk about this, is um, one of my teachers, she has, so, so you know what we're dealing with, she has 30 iPads in her classroom. Um, and I just recently, uh, she said, this year I don't want any supplies. My supply budget, I want an Apple TV. So her principal you know, agreed to that, and she got an Apple TV to start out the year. Um, this week she's begging me to get rid of her um, smart board in her classroom just because she doesn't use it and she wants the HDMI um, capabilities. Um, it is worth noting um, that there is, if with your, when you're looking at these technologies, the Apple TV is HDMI out, but there is a splitter that will split off the video and the audio signal. So let's say you have existing speakers, you can go to the speakers that you have and to a analog or digital video source. So if your projector is DVI or VGA, it still is possible. So just something worth noting, um, it is possible if you don't have an HDMI projector to still have this technology. Um, she, T yes, go ahead. Sorry, TJ, would that have to be, uh, you, so if you split that off, would your projector still have to be uh, HD or can you get away with a standard def projector? Right now, um, I have hers hooked up via DVI. I haven't experimented yet to see how it looks on VGA. Um, we were lucky enough to have a DVI connection on the actual um, projector itself. Um, something to keep in mind, too, now with the new iPads that came out with the mirroring, um, instead of having to purchase, say, a document camera, a responder, uh, this, that, it's all built into the iPad. So she has an instant document camera that she can just set up and she could see what's under it, her kids can see it. And last week when I was in her room, um, one of her students came up to her and said, um, hey, can I just show my, grab one of the iPads and just show my project on the screen so that way everybody can see it. So it's putting the smart board in the student's hands when they're doing interactive projects. And so you're having 30 smart boards that you know, they can use in the classroom instead of just having the one device. Um, it is first come first serve um, and there is some you know, you're putting this control of the board in your students' hands, so there are positive and negative effects that go with that. Um, but so far, it's been extremely, um, extremely well um, taken, and they, I mean, she seems to love it a lot. TJ, how are your Apple TVs connected uh, to your network? Via wireless or wired? Um, wireless. So we're going to see, um, right now, I don't really have a full campus wireless. It's something that we're working on. Um, but wherever the iPads are, there's either an Airport Express or an Airport Extreme. Um, and in her room, it's actually an Airport Express. So it's not a high-end wireless router by any means. Um, but it is. it works great for streaming um, the audio as well as um, she streams audio to some wireless speakers and then video to her projector. And it seems to handle it pretty well. Yeah, um, that's, uh, that's what Sorry, we, we rolled that out uh, at Mechanicsburg as well. Uh, I have about 13 Apple TVs, um, and the staff are slowly, you know, getting trained on on how to use them. And uh, you're right, it's it's pretty neat. I was looking at your your website. The only difference between um, your rollout and mine is 
I saw you used red HDMI cables and I used purple HDMI cables. So mono See, very, cable. Hey, yeah, I mean, exactly. Very, I was just going to say mono price. Yeah. The mono, mono price, price, mono price, price yeah, mono <laughs> price. So, um, but yeah, that's it's very similar to what we did, and you know, we're we're in the process now of finding the perfect apps uh, to use in that in that situation. So, um, but yeah, it's it's kind of a cheating. This is kind of a cheating topic only because it is an interactive tablet that you're projecting onto a whiteboard so uh, but you know because uh, more than half of us uh, use them we had to mention it so and another thing well, too is you don't have to oh, have I'm the sorry, Apple good. TV I'm sorry you didn't have to have the Apple TV you could just hook it up via VGA um, depending on your how far you want to walk your cable um, but you don't have to have that hundred dollar um, Apple TV it just makes life so much easier right not not so much wireless at that point but yeah yeah, but I mean, this was something that we did talk about in our tech prediction show. So, um, you know, if you didn't catch that one, go back a couple of weeks and see. We were saying, you know, with tablets becoming so more much more common in, in the classroom, um, uh, you know, might we need to start thinking differently about, you know, an interactive whiteboard actually going up and touching something or using a pen up at the board, as opposed to saying, okay let's use the tablet and then maybe I can sit and face my class. I can look at all the students while I'm touching it and writing on it rather than turn around backwards and trying to write and stuff. And like you're saying, handing the tablet then out to the kids and letting them pass it around and having them work on it. Um, so when we've looked at you know where we're going as a district, you know, I, I try to be careful and not say smart board like we said because that is like Kleenex, but to say touch sensitive interactive systems or something like that you know so whatever it is you know just the idea of using human touch whether it's with a pen or your hand whether it's a tablet or a board these are a lot of really good options um, and I am curious to see what might end up coming out with um, you know Android tablets this year it's worth noting that splash top is an, is an Android app as well um, I think it's 499 as well I've, uh, I've I've got that one it was actually free on the um, Amazon uh, App Store uh, when I grabbed it that day when it came up free so um, I think that's. I'm glad that we're looking beyond just the normal traditional boards as well. It's it's, it's a good topic. Something that I just thought too with um, Google Docs and things like that. Um, I have a Logitech review. Uh, I actually got it in for review. Um, I think that I think Google TV. There is some potential there. Um, if we step back and look, what do we use our interactive whiteboards for? Um, displaying content um, and interacting. Uh, you do have, I mean, these little set-top boxes, I think we're going to see more and more, too, because there's so many amazing documentaries that, you know, teachers can show in the classroom, you know, given Netflix or YouTube or, you know, and these little set-top boxes that are very inexpensive, I could see as a viable option in the classroom. So maybe, I mean, it might not be interactive whiteboards per se, but, you know, along the same type of technology, I think we're going to see more and more of the Google TV, Apple TV, Roku in the classrooms as well. All right, well, great. I want to say thanks to TJ Houston and also to Nick Ryder for joining us today. Thank you guys very much. That was uh, an amazing podcast, I think. And um, want to let our listeners and viewers know about some of our upcoming episodes. On January 28th will be the follow-up podcast or the sister podcast to this one, uh, and we're going to be talking about integration ideas. And then, as Eric Kurtz mentioned, we will be live February 14th at the eTech conference. So please, we would love to have you in our audience or have you talk with us on stage. Or uh, Eric is going to be signing T-shirts. So it's going to be a wonderful time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, uh, I do want to mention this also real quick, that if you haven't filled out the survey for the Interactive Whiteboard podcast, there's not like a new survey for the one for next week. It's the same survey we used for this episode. There's just questions in there. The first half of the questions were, what are pros and cons about different whiteboards? And the second half of the survey is, how are you using this in your classroom? So if you haven't filled that out yet, please head over to the State of Tech website, just the stateoftech.org, and uh, you'll see the link right there to uh, uh, to that survey and uh, please fill that because what we want to hear now is we want to hear from folks that are using the whiteboards in their classroom or using any of these technologies and tell us what are you doing different because of it how is it transforming your classroom beyond just being a glorified you know whiteboard with pens and so we'd love to hear from folks on that um, speaking of all those different ways to connect with us Eric G why don't you uh, take us out with all that information Thank you. Very nice segue, Eric C. There are several ways to keep in contact with us. Uh, one is by Google Voice. It's 513-318-TECH. Another is Twitter. Um, you can follow us at 
Twitter, or I'm sorry, at the State of Tech. Uh, another is our Gmail account. It's uh, the State of Tech at gmail.com. And don't forget, you know, our show notes are available at thestateoftech.org. If you forgot, we're org. Uh, we are org. And uh, also, please leave a comment on our blog. Um, you know, again, Eric mentioned the surveys. Uh, and lastly, you know, rate us on iTunes. That gets us up there in the uh, new and notable section again, and possibly number one eventually someday. So. Again, thank you for watching the State of Tech, and uh, we'll see you in another couple of weeks for another State of Tech.